Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome to Imam Nawawi's 40 Arba'een. Today we're on hadith number 10. So on the authority of Abu Hurairah radhi ta'ala an who said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah the Almighty is good and accepts only that which is good. And verily Allah has commanded the believers to do that which he has commanded the messengers. So the Almighty has said, O you messengers, eat of the tayyibat and perform righteous deeds. And the Almighty has said, O you who believe, eat of the lawful things that we have provided you. Then he وسلم, mentioned a man who having journeyed far is disheveled and dusty and who spreads out his hands to the sky saying, O Lord, O Lord, while his food is haram, his drink is haram, his clothing is haram and he has been nourished with the haram. So how can his supplication be answered? So one of the first things that we learn from this hadith is that whatever has been commanded for the Messenger of Allah or the Prophet has been commanded for mankind as well. Sometimes we like to put uh, the companions also on pedestals thinking that they're impossible to emulate. But if they were impossible to emulate, then we wouldn't be asked to emulate them. Then they wouldn't be role models for us, would they? So the messengers are role models for us. What they do, we can do also. And we can emulate them to the best of our, our ability. And each person is endowed with the ability, the tawfiq, to do what he can do. So everybody is, is on an equal plane. If this is your ability from Allah and you achieve this much, this is your reward. If this is your ability and you achieve this much, you've achieved the reward of somebody whose ability is here and he has achieved this much. So everybody is on an equal field. Yes, the prophets can do far more than we can. And not necessarily the companions can do far more than you can. There are many, there are many a companion that had the same vices and problems that we had and that were punished for those things. There were companions that were punished for drinking. There were companions that were lashed for um, slander and so forth. So any command in the Quran that comes for the Prophet is basically a command for us as this hadith says. So what the Prophets can do, we can do and we should try to emulate the Prophets as best as we can. The idea of wholesomeness is something that's Beautiful, something that's complete, something that's tayyib, that's good, uh, halal, because the halal is good, that's one of the other meanings of tayyib, and something that, that has the idea of completedness. So, for example, most people will talk about food that is halal, uh, tayyib and tahir. Tahir means pure and tayyib means wholesome. So, from a fiqh point of view, just because something is allowed, is that best practice? So an example, an analogy here would be um, four wives. Now we know it's allowed, but would it be best pra practice for you to do now? Would it be best practice if you've already got problems in your first marriage? We know marrying a child, thick wise if we're looking at it just from a thick point of view about the halal and the haram, just as a point of halal and haram, marrying a very young girl, a father marrying her after someone, and then she at attaining puberty and going to live with that person. Is that allowed? That is allowed. And that's, that was, was generally the case in all uh, cultures up to very recently. And in some cultures, that's still the case. When I said it was, I'm looking at America here and England here. In the Victorian era, that was, that was happening. So would that be best practice, though, today? You know, where women have uh, rights to education, jobs, careers, a life, something to do. It wouldn't be best practice. Likewise, in the past or in certain cir circumstances, it would be best practice. So there's a difference between what's halal and what's best practice. Your meat that you slaughter, you could raise chickens in the atrocious conditions that they are raised in and then slaughter them and they're halal. But are they wholesome? Would that be tayyib? No, that wouldn't be tayyib. That's not the best meat for you to eat. The whole idea around how it was raised as well is not good. And let's just say you've slaughtered it. So you've raised an organic chicken and you're slaughtering it and it's halal, it's tayyib, it's tahir, it's, it's done perfectly. There's a wholesomeness around it. But what if you had that chicken and that chicken was raised in a wholesome way but when it came to slaughtering it, you bashed it around a bit. 
or you started slaughtering one after the other where everybody could watch. Is that considered wholesome? No. Now you become deficient in your action. So it's not complete, it's not wholesome. So this is the understanding we draw from this, that Allah loves the tayyib. There needs to be a wholesomeness around your whole life. Allah accepts. Allah is good and accepts only what is good. So we look at examples as we move along the slides here. So first of all, lawfulness and wholesomeness mirror godliness. As, as I just mentioned, wholesomeness, Allah is good and loves only the good. So he wants from us the good. So even when we give charity and food and everything, it must be all good and wholesome. <coughs> Eating from the hands of people that are not wholesome have implications. If you go to restaurants, even if you know the food is tahir, it's slaughtered, it's tayyib as in the halal tayyib. It's slaughtered according to Islam, it's halal meat. But yet the guy who cooks the food for you, he only sings melodies when he cooks the food. Or he's gossiping, backbiting, or he's somebody who doesn't pray. His spiritual effects will be imbibed or imbued whatever that word is into the into the meat so it's got there is something of his essence in that meat now that's been shared with that meat and that's what you're eating whereas if you know someone that does a thakar when he kills he remembers Allah he's silent when he's cooking there's a lot of barakah in that in that uh, meal so people of taqwa people of wholesomeness people who are mutayyib they are very cautious of where they eat from where they sit and eat. So you've got wholesome food and you're sitting with people that are gossiping. The, the wholesomeness of the atmosphere is gone. So you need to be very mindful and, and, and cr to create wholesomeness in your life is something bigger than just saying, oh, this is halal and haram. And, and as long as I fulfill the bare minimum, the bare minimum is halal and haram. You know, it's put you on the edge of one side or the other side. But is that what Allah wants? Is that what Allah seeks from you? For example, your prayer can be sound or unsound. It can be unwholesome or it can be wholesome. Tayyib or non tayyib How, for example, let's say you go into the mosque and you're, you put your best clothes on. And you're going to the mosque and your intention is to pray in the best way. But you have a cigarette just before you pray. So you go into the mosque and now you're smelling of cigarettes. You've taken the wholesomeness away from your prayer. You've taken, you've disturbed other people. Or oh, you're angry. So people are jostling you and you jostle, jostle back. Or you're going to such that someone's taking up a lot of space and you deliberately spread your hands wide, deliberately to kind of assert your position. You've taken the wholesomeness away from your prayer. At that time, whatever, whatever befalls you, accept it in silence because that's a test from Allah to see if you are tayyib, mutayyib. Because Allah is good and loves goodness. So Allah is judging you, not that person. Allah is not going to say, Allah is going to ask you about that action. Possibly He could ask you about that action and he's, you're going to say, well, He did it. God can say, I didn't ask you about him, I'm asking you about how you responded. So this is what we should always be mindfulness about. Being mindful is a precursor to wholesomeness because it makes sure everything is done and put in its pro proper comp uh, place. Comportment and adab have the same understanding, the same, the same idea. They all go together. You could be going to the mosque and on the way you fight somebody. So you, you're prepared to go to the mosque on the way you had a slanging match. Or you dress badly, but your heart is sound and you're going to the mosque and you're praying with a sound heart. But why did you dress badly? So everything looks good at the right time, in its right place, and each fits together. If you have a jigsaw puzzle and one piece is missing from the jigsaw, even if 99% is complete, you notice there's a piece missing and that takes away from the overall beauty. It's, it's glaring, it's an eyesore, it's jarring to what you're looking at. Likewise. If one part of your action is missing, like imagine a person wearing a beautiful thobe, beautiful sandals, beautiful uh, itar. He's walking to the mosque, but he's missing his headgear. Something straight away will be amiss, and you'll notice it and say, oh, you know, it's, it's just taken away from the overall look. It doesn't go now. That, that turban would have been the icing on top of the cake. And a cake, indeed, a cake without a cherry or an icing looks very different from a cake with the icing and the cake. So <clears throat> this is the kind of uh, metaphors we're using here. When you pray, you can pray. I'm just building on examples so that we can implement them in our lives. So imagine, imagine you can pray in, in, a, in a wrist wrapper. That's fine. If you've got nothing else to pray in, you can pray in that. That's the best you're doing. But if you have something else and you just wear a wrist wrapper, you know, you, know, you just can't be bothered to put on some, a thought. Has your prayer been accepted? Yes. Could you have done better? Yes. 
right? So you've taken the wholesomeness away from your prayer. You've taken the maximum reward that you could have gained. The comportment of that prayer, the other of that prayer, you've just taken away something and you've left it incomplete when it could have been complete. Your Iman, your Iman, is your Iman wholesome? Is it Tayyib? You know, with the Kalima uh, Tayyiba, a good word, a good word. Why do we call the, the declaration of faith a good word? And it's, it's a good word that has a sense of complete wholesomeness inside that word. So if you have perfect Iman, you have sound Iman and wholesome Iman. If there's deficiencies, then you're, again your Iman is deficient. You need to strengthen it to make it complete and beautiful and perfect and presented to Allah when you die. Example, another example is a, a cup of coffee. When somebody asks you for coffee, when you present them the coffee, do you just half boil it and give it? Well, if you did that, you have made coffee. And if he drinks it, it tastes somewhat like coffee. But you didn't do the best job. And he could have enjoyed a better coffee. You did give him coffee. Someone might even say, is this coffee? This is not even coffee. Go and bring me another cup of coffee. Right? Or somebody else will say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to stay quiet. It is coffee. You know, he's not done a good job, but I don't want to say nothing. But you could have done an excellent job and he would have appreciated it as such as well. For example, you have half an hour and you want to bang out 20 nawafila, or you want to read two juice of Quran. You'll be very speedily doing them. And then there's the other person who is calm and in 20 minutes he only manages to do four rakah. But there was complete mindfulness, there was complete adab, there was complete uh, watching over oneself, being in the moment and being wholesome in the action which is more valid, which is more beloved to Allah the one who's read the Quran with proper tajweed, tartil he's pondering over the verses, he's stopping, he may weep, he may, may, he may make dua in between and he's only managed to finish a page where you finish two juz whose is more better? so that's the idea of wholesomeness be wholesome in whatever you do it may take you longer to read two raka in wholesomeness and making it tayyib than to read 20 raka in the same amount of time but it's been rushed through and it's quantity that's very poor over quality that one would have sufficed those 20. So these are the things that we need to be wary of. And, and this translates to wholesomeness in every action, every facet of your life. So for example, sleeping is sleep. It's a carnal need. I've heedlessly gone to sleep. Was that a wholesome action? That was. I wouldn't say that was a wholesome action. I would say that was a. That was an. That was an instinctive, carnal. That was an instinctive, bodily need. That's all I've did. I've just fulfilled a bodily need and responded instinctively and fallen asleep. But had I been mindful of the action and said, "Oh Allah, I'm tired now. I'm gonna sleep for you," and I pray. Uh, the athkar of sleep, I sleep for Allah, that becomes rewardful. And then I wake up. For example, when Allah said, uh, when we eat, is that a need? Is that a need that we have or is it for Allah? 99.9% .9 of the time people eat, eat because there's a need and they just eat. But if you were mindful for a second and says, Allah says, eat and drink of the halal, of the tayyib. Then each time you do that saying, oh Allah, I'm doing it because you commanded us to do it. Subhanallah. Then it becomes rewardful, right? It becomes rewardful. So this is what mindfulness is and wholesomeness is and comportment is correct adab. Doing everything in its right place. And if this translates into your whole life, your work, your, your waking hours, sleeping hours, hours of rest, hours of repose, hours of activity, every single thing becomes like a perfect picture without any jarring salient bits and it's presented as something perfect and beautiful to Allah this is the idea Allah is beautiful and loves beauty Allah is good and loves good like half-baked they say don't do something half-baked if you're gonna do it do it properly or don't attempt it half-baked there's an understanding beyond that as well and a wholesomeness life is full of blessings so in the West, we're, we're forever short of money. Allah's given us ni'mas, but we're forever short of cash. Why? Because how many of us go to work and there's backbiting, or we're complaining about the furniture, we're complaining about the station, we're complaining about the state of the computers, we're complaining about the floor, 
the atmosphere, the AC, the heating, our work, or if the managers put some more work on us, why have they changed this? There's resentment, there's resilience, all of this. But if you go to the third world, they don't have AC or heaters or proper chairs. They don't complain, they just get on with it. When you go to their houses, they have a little bit and they it just it looks so much more beautiful what they're offering you because it's plain fair, it's simple fair, it's full of love, barakah and wholesomeness. You'll see the people in the third world tend to uh, complain less. That was a, a very beautiful lesson that I learned in my time abroad. It's coming from an atmosphere here, you know, it's, it's the West, we're, we're not people that are thankful by our nature, our culture doesn't really, it's not really a culture of thankfulness or gratefulness, it's always complaining about something or another. We feel very entitled and when those rights that we feel are due upon us are not given, we're very vocal about them. But in the third world, we're whether you're vocal or not, it's not going to change nothing. The best course of action is silence and there's beauty in their silence and you see that and you learn a lot. That's why there's beauty when you go to their houses, whereas you, you find that lacking in going into people's houses and eating in this, in, 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 in this part of the world. That's not to say it's, you know, this is a, gen, uh, a, a, a statement that is just general everywhere, but for the most part it's general. Yes, there are the houses of the alima and some people who are blessed and some people who live, live, live house and life. You feel that everywhere. You generally know that when you go to their house. And one thing I've noticed is their houses seem to be a bit spartan because they don't live for this dunya, they live for the hereafter. And you feel the barakah in that spartanness. And that's the reason why the, the, you'll see that, you know, how can they all afford, how can they have a car when you can't afford a car here? How can they have enough money to uh, you know, educate their children where education is free for us and then we still struggle to buy stationery for our children. These are the reasons why because there's barakah and wholesomeness in what they've done. They're thankful in their lives and Allah increases it. Uh, another thing Imam Nabawi mentions in, in his commentary on this hadith is the idea of, of uh, mixing the haram and the halal so for example giving the haram so so if if Allah loves only that is good if Allah is good and loves only the only that which is good when you're giving charity it's makro to give charity that's not from the best of your items so the best charity is the one that's the best of what you're giving what's more dear to you so if I've got a second-hand phone you know, and, and I know it's not going to go nowhere, so I'm thinking, well, is, instead of throwing it, I'll just give it to charity. This was actually the action of the hypocrites. In the time of Rasul this was the action of the hypocrites. When they gave charity, it was the worst of their items, and items that would have gone in the bin anyway. That doesn't mean that we don't do that. It's better to still give char charity, you know, with the correct intention, instead of throwing it in the bin. Allah will accept it, inshallah, but it's not, it's makru. It's not the best action. The, the highest form of charity is something that's very dear to you. So try this. This is very hard to do. Buy a jacket, for example. That's a very nice jacket that you'd buy for yourself. Wear it once and then give it to charity. You know, you find that very strenuous on yourself, very difficult. Why? Because now you're giving something that's beloved to you. What's beloved to you, that's the best form of charity that you give to other people. Even if you do that just the once. Rasulullah did that many times. You know, he was gifted items that he really liked and then he gave them away. Likewise, to give bad food. So when you're going to give food to somebody, give the best food to them. Whatever you eat, give. Would you eat bad food? Would you eat food that's close to going off or that's infested with weevils or that's been soiled, thinking, oh, you know what, I don't want to throw it, I'll give it to a poor person. SubhanAllah, yani, try to eat that food yourself and give, give somebody the best food. Just like you want the best, they want the best as well. And they say that uh, you know, a mu'min is one who loves for his brother what he loves for himself. So putting that hadith in, in front of you, then give the best to best to him as well. Uh, and it's makru to give the doubtful things. So there's two things here. So people have the understanding that interest is haram. So when they get interest, they say, well, the, you can either say to your bank, we're not going to take interest. Fine, that's good. But sometimes the bank still gives you interest. You can't stop that. That interest we know we can't spend. So it's from, it's called mal uh, majhul, which means it's, it's wealth that is unknown, the source is unknown. That came to you through an unknown source, you don't know whether it's doubtful or undoubtful. It's makru to give that as well. But when we give that out to somebody, because it wasn't ours, one of the understandings of sadaqah is, is that it, you need to have ownership of 
something. So if I've got the ownership of a pound and I'm giving it, then that's sadaqah. But if I don't actually own something and it, was just, it just came into my possession, you know, I'm not going to get reward by repassing that on, especially in the case of where it's interest. So we give it with the understanding that there's no reward in it. But I can't eat of it. I can't eat of it. I'm just giving it. Giving it. it may benefit somebody else. It will benefit somebody else. But the problem with that is, again, it's an unknown source. So we have to be careful. Where did that money come from? You know, did it come? Was that interest generated from haram sources that the banks were doing? So these are all things to think about as well. Likewise, gambling. Gambling, traditionally, in the time of Rasul the Arabs would gamble for fun. The money that they would accumulate, they would give in charity. That was their form of, of charity. Right? I mean, it's free money, isn't it? You're giving free money like that. So it, it, it suits the purpose of, oh, yes, we're very charitable, very generous, as they claim to be. And yet we've had our fun, we've got the money for free. And this is when the ayat of gambling came that this is exactly what the Quran is warning against. So some people still say that. They say, oh, if I win the lottery, how many times have you heard? If I win the lottery, oh Allah, I am going to give this many million. I swear by, by your izza, I will give this many millions to charity. That's all going to be haram because Allah doesn't want that from you. And Allah accepts what is pure. That is not pure. That's haram money that you've accumulated. So you can't then give that on. So you need to think about these things as well. Likewise, actions, actions that you do need to be pure as well. If you mix some of the haram, uh, some, of, uh, some of the dubious into your actions, makru into your actions. For example, I'm praying and then somebody comes into the room and all of a sudden I'm straight to my back deliberately. Sometimes you, you can't help that, that's different. But I'm, I now I lengthen my sujood or I do something else. The part that I did that, that wasn't for Allah anymore, it was for Him. So is Allah going to accept that? You know, Allah is pure and accepts the pure. Allah is tayyib, accepts the good. So we need to make sure that there's no extra showing off or we tell people our rewards. Because the more you tell people about your rewards as well, that's the more you're giving part of that ajr that you could have earned. To, you know, you're giving it, it's gone for free. It's gone, you didn't get it. So likewise, embellishments in prayer, showing off and exaggerations and in talk and, and all of this, you know, we, we do it for Allah's sake only and we... Show Allah our actions are pure for His sake only. Illahi. So the like the Meccans themselves understood what pure money was because when they built the Kaaba when it was destroyed by by fire, and they rebuilt it in the time of Rasulullah so in the famous story, the firewood was was gathered the wood for it was gathered by a sunken ship that had sunk off Jeddah. And then they had to raise money. And because they were dabbling in interest and dabbling in dubious sources, they didn't have enough money to even make the Kaaba. So they got together all of the halal money that they could, and they built the Kaaba. And it, it, was on, it was on dimensions that were bigger than they are today. And that's why Hadim area, the area, the semicircular area, is still left like it is today because they didn't have enough money to finish that off. So intrinsically, even they knew what was good or, good or bad. But when it came to a dire need like that, a sacred need for the sake of Allah that they had a lot of hurma for, a lot of respect for, they didn't mess around. But then they tried to circumnavigate in other areas of their life. They, they would do that. Like the gambling issue we mentioned. It's like Jews when they have to, women have to cover their hair. So what do they do? The women shave their heads off. Like before marriage they have their hair straight, after marriage they shave their heads off and wear a wig. You know, it's like circumnavigating and and this is not what Allah accepts and this is not what Allah asks for as well. So the hadith says, eat of the good and do good work. So they, everything goes hand in hand. So the, so the what's mutayyab can be in food, wholesomeness and in your actions. And your actions are a reflection of who you are and your life. So in effect, Allah loves the wholesome life. So make your life, life wholesome in every facet. This is the strongest meaning here that I've taken from this hadith. Then the hadith uh, concludes with Rasul Sallallahu words where he says, you know, there's a man who's dusty, disheveled, traveling and his clothes, uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, uh, he's weary and everything and he raises his hands and says, Ya Allah, you know, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, Oh Lord, Oh Lord. Yet, you know, everything he's wearing is from the haram. His clothes are haram, the food is haram. And how will Allah answer his prayer? And it's a rhetorical how will Allah here? Meaning that when you travel, when you travel, you're in your, your, 
you know, you're, you're more, a lot more receptive to your du'as when you travel anyway, because travel is a form of extreme hardship. The picture that Rasulullah SAW gave here of this man, this disheveled man in the desert, you know, thirsty, dust everywhere, dirty clothes and everything, and he's raising his hands and with sincerity, you know, when you're in the desert alone and you raise your hands up and when you're suffering, it's a sincere du'a. How will Allah answer his du'a? You know, how does he expect Allah to listen to him when, when he's, his clothes are haram? Everything is haram. The food in his belly is haram. But who is he asking? He's asking his Lord the most generous. So there is an understanding here. With the understanding we take, the twofold understanding we take from here is how will Allah answer him? Number one, it's a, it's a warning for us. Hey, be careful, be wholesome. And it's also how will he answer, meaning nothing is impossible for Allah. Allah can still answer your prayer. He's so generous, He answers the prayers of non-Muslims. How many non-Muslims have you seen that's got everything? They commit sins and they ask and Allah has given them. The biggest culprit here was who? Shaitan, Iblis. When having angered Allah, He asked Allah for respite for a while and Allah gave Him His wish. Allah can give Shaitan. You know, we're, we're, we are not all the way there as Shaitan at the moment. May Allah preserve us from getting there or even being half Shaitan. So we have that, we have that uh, faith in Allah that Allah will answer those du'as. But we try to live our life uh, in a wholesome way and we know that Allah is more receptive to our du'as when we do what Allah wants. So this is the, the meaning and understanding of this hadith. So we ask Allah to make us be of the mutayyib. We ask Allah to make us live pure lives, wholesome lives, tayyib lives, tahir lives. We ask Allah to make the food that we eat halal and it be a blessing and a barakah for us to do more action. And may Allah make us more mindful in our lives, have correct comportment and have wholesomeness in our life whereby we can present a complete picture to Allah Azza wa Jal about our lives in the most best way that we could. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته